In the beginning, finish it with me, God created the heavens and the earth. Never have ten words been perhaps so well known, but also quite so controversial. Ten words that uh, begin the Bible, to be sure, but more than that, many have believed down through the ages describe the beginning how we began, where we came from. How did we get here? Where did we come from? Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, many believe that the creation story of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 are not only a description of what happened, but how God actually created when He chose to create the world. That He took six days, and on each day He created some different part of our world. On the first day, he separated the light from darkness. On the second day, he created the sky. On the third day, he separated water from land and created plants and vegetation and trees. On the fourth day, God created the stars and the moon and the sun. Just listen to a portion of the story as we pick up in Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. On the fifth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the living, the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the waters teem according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. This is a part of the story of what many believe explains our origins. This is the account that lets us know where we've come from, why we're here, and ultimately where we're going. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And according to the Bible, it's because of the fact that God is our creator, because of the fact that he wove us together and thought us up and created everything around us, it's because he did these things that makes him worthy of our worship. That he deserves to be worshipped by us because not only did he create everything around us, but he created us. Revelation chapter 4 describes a worship service that's taking place in heaven. And in this heavenly worship service, we get to verse 11, and we find these heavenly beings standing around the throne of God, and they're singing this anthem in verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. I mean, what what these heavenly beings are worshiping God for, we intuitively know that God deserves our worship because he created all things. He created me. But over the past few centuries, this belief that God created all things has come under scrutiny. The popular way of thinking is that the creation story of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 was a good story for naive, uneducated people living in centuries past. But we're enlightened now. 
And we live in in an age of science and, and reason, and we know better. I mean, really, hasn't evolution put God out of a job? Doesn't it prove that God didn't create us? And if it does, doesn't that mean that he's really not worthy of our worship? Well, today we come to uh, the fourth question in our series, Questions Christians Hope No One Will Ask. And we've been looking at these questions that Christians in a national Barna survey have said they hope never comes up in conversation. And there's a variety of reasons of why we hope these things won't come up in conversation. One is that we may know what we believe, but we wouldn't really know how to talk about it or or defend what we believe to someone who has serious doubts. And so we hope these questions don't come up in conversation. Or I think another reason we hope these questions never come up is because these are questions and doubts that we have ourselves. And so we hope that they don't come up because in talking about them, that will expose our own doubts to ourselves that we may have about the Christian faith. And so far, we've considered the issues of Jesus's divinity of the reliability of the Bible. And last week, Pastor Lisa spent time on the issue of suffering, how a good God could allow bad things to happen. Now, before we get to today's question, the fourth question, I want to again just reference uh, Mark Middleberg and give him uh, acknowledgement. He was the one who um, uh, started the, the, the Barna survey to find out what these questions would be. He subsequently wrote a book about it. And a lot of what we're talking about, and certainly the idea for the series, has come from Middleburg's work. And I just want to uh, thank him for what he's done. Today's question actually um, was toward the top of the list of those questions Christians really, really hope no one will ask. It was actually, I think it was number two that came up on the list. This is one that we really don't want in our conversations. The question, you've heard it already. Has an evolution put God out of a job? Why trust religion in an age of science and reason? It's the old creation versus evolution debate. Religion versus science. It is something that is, uh, remains a hot topic in, in our culture. Uh, it has been for quite some time, but School boards battle over what should be put in textbooks. I mean, should evolution be taught as truth or as theory? Can creation be in there? I mean, people have lost their jobs over the issue. People have lost their reputations over what they believe on this topic. Uh, It was just last week I was sitting with the head of a biology department at a major university, and we were talking about this very topic, and he was telling me um, about the pressure that he was under because of his beliefs and uh, the, the, the things that were underway to change learning and even medicine, saying that there is a push underway that doctors will not be able to practice medicine unless they subscribe to Darwinian evolution. So Charles Darwin referred to his famous book on the origin of species as one long argument. And 150 years later, the argument still rages. Where did we come from? What is the meaning of science? What is the role of faith? Did God create the world and everything in it? Or did everything living come about by a common ancestor, by the principle of, of random selection? Listen, young people, how we answer this question has so much more impact on our lives and what happens in the wall of a church. This is not going to stay between your ears and your head. This is not just an intellectual debate because how you answer this question of where we came from will have multiple implications for how you live your life, how you view yourself, and who you will worship. Okay? How you do, this is not just again an intellectual debate where do we come from, evolution or creation. How you answer this question will impact, again, your self-image. Where did you come from? Are you simply an accident, or were you created by a loving God for a purpose? It will impact um, who you will worship. Will you worship chance, or will you worship God? It will impact your idea of where we are going. Are we going to nothingness, or are we going to eternal life? This is a very important topic. And let me just say, there are really smart people on both sides of this issue. Okay, there are really smart people on both sides of this issue. Now, you may not believe that if you listen to the rhetoric. 
because a common stereotype is that creationists are ignorant, uneducated, backward, kind of hillbilly people who have checked their brains at the door and just ignore evidence. We just don't want to see any evidence. We're just going to have faith. And on the other hand, um, evolutionists also often have the stereotype, even within Christianity, of being these intellectual elite thinkers who have all of the facts on their side. Well, and, and, and let me just say, I've heard Christians say things that have kind of kept the, the, the stereotype going for Christians. Um, things that make me kind of cringe. There was one young lady who was defending her faith in creation and, on God, and, and in God with an atheist, and this is what she said. She said, um, are you going to believe the evidence or are you going to believe God? And I'm like, really? Is that what we've come to? We have to like choose between, you know, evidence and God. And I mean, am I really required to ignore truth? I mean, do we have to blindly trust God's word in an age of scientific reason? I mean, has evolution really put God out of a job and we're just burying our heads in the sand? I mean, trusting in something that is just ridiculous? Well, I want to answer this question by just, again, as we have every week, just giving three talking points. So if this question comes up in conversation, you would have three places to start in order to, to start a conversation that I think would lead to some great and respectful and humble dialogue. The first point, I, I, it was kind of maybe a surprise to you. I remember the first time this kind of really dawned on me. But the first point uh, about did evolution put out a, God out of a job would be this, that Darwinian evolution doesn't even try to answer the question of where life came from. Think about this. Darwin's theory on evolution and we'll unpack that in a second, but it doesn't attempt to address the question of where life came from. He doesn't give any theory on where matter came from, where the universe came from, where the first life came from. He simply starts with an assumption of the first life, a single-cell organism, and then tells how more complex organisms came out of that most simple organism, but he doesn't tell really where life came from. And, and Darwin's theory, in a nutshell, is just that all species of life have a common ancestor. That whether you're a human or a, a dog or a worm or a rhinoceros, we all come from that first single-celled life, a microbe or whatever you want to call it. And the theory says that one type of creature, creature can, with the right circumstances and enough time, adapt itself and pass on those adaptations to future generations until it becomes a new species. So that a fish given enough time and the right conditions, can become a lizard, and that a lizard, given enough time and the right conditions, can become a bird, and that a monkey, given enough time and the right conditions, can become a human being. We've probably all heard this theory. But according to the theory, this is exactly what happened, that the first single-cell organism uh, made small, gradual changes. It made adaptations. And the adaptations that were good, that made the organism stronger, better, more adapted to, to live in its environment, those lived longer and passed on those adaptations to future generations. And those that made adaptations that were made it weaker or not able to survive in its environment as well, those species died off and weren't able to pass on those adaptations to future generations. You've heard it referred to as the survival of the fittest. And as the theory goes, the single-celled organism made enough modifications to become a fish, and then the fish made enough modifications to become a lizard and so on, and that's where humans came from. And that, that in a nutshell, I mean, very simply, is Darwinian evolution. And, and the idea is that this theory put God out of a job. And that's the question we're trying to address here, that we no longer need God because Darwin tells us where life came from. But the reality is, Darwin never even attempted to answer the question of where life came from. He simply begins with the common ancestor, the microbe or that single-celled organism. He assumes it was already there, but where did it come from? Where did the universe come from? Where did the matter for that single-celled organism come from? How was that first cell assembled? These are questions that demand an answer, and evolution does not attempt to, to, uh, to answer those questions. Darwinian evolution. 
Maybe you've heard the joke. It's circulated on the internet. It tells the story of a bunch of scientists that got together and they decided that they had made enough advancements, that humankind had made enough ad- advancements that we no longer needed God. And so they picked one scientist and that scientist was going to go tell God that we didn't need him anymore. And so he, this man approached God and said, God, you know, we have made incredible advances with what you've given us and we thank you for that. But, you know, we're now cloning people and doing other miraculous things and we really don't need you anymore. So you can kind of take a break and go off and, and do your own thing, but just let us do our thing. And God listened very patiently to the scientist as he went on and he said, okay, well, I'd just like to propose one thing. I would like to have a people-making contest with you. And the scientist thought about it. He said, all right, we can handle that. And God said, but we're going to do this old school. We have to make a person the way I made Adam, okay? Scientist thought about it and said, all right, I can handle that. And he bent down and he picked up a handful of dirt. And God said, no, 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 get your own dirt. (laughs) You see, the issue... We think that we could take the building blocks of life and try to put them together and say we've made life, but we're dependent on having those building blocks already in existence in order to come up with a life. You can't make a more complex organism from that single-celled organism without first creating the universe. I mean, that's step number one. First, we have to create the universe. Then we can get to the building blocks of life and then to that first single cell organism and then on to bigger and better things. And so in order to explain where the universe came from, then we start using terms like Big Bang. And I'm open to talking about Big Bang. But again, I would say, where did the matter from the Big Bang come from? And these are all ultimate questions we all have to to, to grapple with, creationists and evolutionists alike. But if, if you listen to the explanation of the Big Bang, it's from you know, all matter came from an infinitesimally small point in time and space that ultimately exploded, filling the entire universe with all of the matter that we now know and is now expanding outward at an incredible rate of speed. And if you ask me, the Big Bang sounds like a supernatural event. I I don't see how that could just happen. Or others will say that the building blocks of life were just there and they were naturally attracted to each other. They came together to form the first life, but that's since been disproved that life can't just be attracted to each other. Or others say that life was brought together riding on the back of crystals. Or others promote the idea of panspermia that says that aliens came and planted life on our planet. And this is something that's really got a lot of credibility even in the scientific world, panspermia. But I'm like, really? Really? Aliens? I mean, is this what we have come to, to scratch God out of the equation, that we're willing to believe in aliens, but not in a loving God? Here's my point. Rather than put God out of a job, I believe that Darwinian evolution is dependent on God to get off of the ground. See, because it doesn't answer the question of where life came from, And so rather than put God out of a job, it's dependent on God to get the universe going and to bring that first life along and to assemble it so that Darwinian evolution could then kind of take off if that is indeed what happened. So our first talking point would just be that evolution doesn't try to answer the question of where life came from. And the second talking point I would come to is one that I'm I'm kind of passionate about. Um, This will keep me up late into the night talking if you ever want to have a dialogue. But number two would be that both evolution and creation are issues of faith. Both need faith. Trust is required for either one. Whether you believe God created the world in six days, or if you believe all life came from a common ancestor through a process of random selection, you need to believe something that cannot be proven. Okay, either one, you need to believe something that cannot be proven. And I mentioned this idea two weeks ago as we talked about the reliability of the Bible that something that happened in the past cannot be proven. And I use the example of, of going to a Rockies game. I could say I went to the Rockies game yesterday and you could question me on that and I could try to give evidence like a ticket stub or maybe even a picture of me and Troy Tulowitzki with the date stamped on the picture. But if you don't want to believe me, you could explain away any evidence I give you. Well, you know, that's Photoshop and you know, that's not really you or you got the ticket from the trash or, or whatever. I mean, it takes a certain amount of faith to believe anything that happened. Now, it doesn't take a lot of faith to believe I went to the Rockies game yesterday. But the farther back we go with, it, with an incident in history, it takes more and more and more faith. For instance, something that happened 200 years ago, it takes a bit more faith to believe that it actually happened the way historians recorded it versus me going to the Rockies game yesterday. We don't know those historians who wrote those things down. We don't know what their agenda was. 
right? But we can look at the evidence and put corroborating stories together and come up with, I, I think this probably happened the way they said. But that still takes faith. Now we go back even further and further, 2,000 years. Go to the very beginning of the world. We go to the beginning of the world, the creation of the world, and no one was there to witness it. No one wrote down what was happening as it happened. But we look at the evidence and try to determine what makes sense and what seems to be possible or what seems to be probable, but still, whatever you believe about where life came from, it's going to have to take a certain amount of faith to believe that. And I can't tell you how much it drives me crazy when, when I'm talking to someone who has an evolutionist perspective that says, well, evolution has been proven. It's a scientifically proven fact that we have evolved from a single cell. And that's simply ignorance on, on the terms. It can't be proven. Some may look at the evidence and determine that this is the most likely scenario of where life came from, but it will never be proven. At the same time, creationists drive me crazy. When they say God has been proven or creation has been proven, uh, just look at the evidence. It's all been proven. It hasn't been proven. It will never be proven. It can't be proven ever. Nothing that took place in the past can ever be proven. We look at the evidence and determine what we believe. And that takes faith. Creationists can't answer all the questions. Evolutionists can't answer all the questions. You look at the evidence, you say, I think I'm staking my claim here because the evidence makes the most sense over here. Now, as we look at the evidence, again, we see that there are questions for creationists to answer that are very, very hard questions. We don't have a, a, a watertight argument on, on how the world was created. In the same time, so do evolutionists. And we find that there are problems with Darwinian evolution that will stretch one's faith. And I'd like to share just a few with you. For instance, as we look at the evidence for Darwinian evolution, the fossil record uh, produces some problems. Um, since none of us were around when the e evolution was, was going on, one might suspect that the evolutionist's greatest ally would be the fossil record. And those records would show what happened as those species were developing and dying and being embedded in, in layers and whatnot. There's just one problem. The fossils give very little uh, record, if any at all, to any kind of intermediary kind of transitionary species from one species to the other, like Darwin would suggest. One example in the, in the fossil record is what's called the Cambrian Explosion. And it's a layer in the fossil record in which basically every animal intact kind of came into being and boom, one, one time. And, uh, you know, even famous um, evolutionists like Richard Dawkins in commenting on the Cambrian explosion says things like, it is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Kind of, you can see him scratching his head. How did this come to be? Charles Darwin himself, when asked about this phenomenon, said, I can give no satisfactory answer. And later on, he actually admitted, he said, nature may almost be said to have guarded against the frequent discovery of her transitional or linking forms. Okay, so this problem, as we look for evidence for um, the evolution of species, it doesn't seem to be there. Or consider the problem of irreducible complexity. This is an idea that's brought out by a non-Christian biophysicist, Michael Behe. He wrote a beautiful book called Darwin's Black Box, in which he unpacks the idea of irreducible complexity. And in, in his book, he talks about systems that are, that are irreducibly complex, that have all these different moving parts, and every part is needed in order for that organism to function, and how it would be impossible for something like that to evolve. And I, he uses, I, I think, the, the mousetrap as one illustration. Um, if you look at a mouse trap, it's a pretty simple thingy mechanism there. It's got about nine or ten moving parts. You have the base and these different little things that hold the different parts down. You've got like this little trigger thing and, and the kill flippy thing that's going to take the mouse its head off. And you've got the, where you put the bait. It's about nine or ten different parts. But if you take any one of those parts off of the mouse trap, it doesn't work. It can't work. And this is a simple illustration of the idea of irreducible complexity, that there are systems in nature and in our bodies that are so incredibly complex, that need so many parts in order to function, 
Darwinian evolution can't answer how that could ever have evolved. For instance, we, we, use, the, we use the illustration of an eye, and uh, Behe points out that the eye has 50-some different moving parts. How could that evolve? Because all of the parts are needed. You remove one part from the eye, how could it have evolved? Now, in Darwinian theory, if I make an adaptation in a species, now we started with a single cell, it obviously didn't have eyes, so the eyes would eventually have to have evolved. But as a species is making adaptations, if the adaptation is helpful, then the species would pass it on and keep it. But if it wasn't helpful, then it would eliminate that adaptation. So the question is, what good is 5% of an eye? It's no good and it would be eliminated. What good is 50% of an eye? It's no good. You can get 25, 30, 40 parts of an eye together. They're no good. They will be eliminated. So how could the eye have evolved an irreducibly complex organism? And to this, Darwin said, uh, well, first of all, he said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And we have discovered those things, like the eye, like the clotting of blood, which is a, an amazing thing that happens every time you get a cut. But then he went on to say about the eye, he said, to suppose that the eye, with so many parts all working together, could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. Good point. All right, final talking point, and we'll end here. Our, our first two points, evolution doesn't try to, to address the question of where life came from. Two, both evolution and creation are issues of faith, We've got to look at the evidence. And I would say, number three, it takes more faith to believe in evolution. It's, I, I just, that's where I am. Obviously, not everyone's there. But I believe that it takes more faith to believe that we happen by chance than that there is an eternal God who has always existed outside of time and space who can create us for a plan. And I know that's a stretch for many people. It's a stretch for people to believe that there is a God, let alone a God who has no beginning. And the question comes up, well, where did God come from? And we say, well, he's just always existed. And they say, well, that's a cop-out. I understand that. Um, I understand it's a stretch to believe that God spoke a world and created the world and everything in it. That it's a stretch to believe that he did it in, in six days. And that takes a lot of faith. But let's consider the possibility that it happened just by chance, spontaneously, without God, and the faith that's required to believe that. Several years ago, when my boys were younger, I had a play date with them. Mom was out for some reason, and I decided that we were going to do a little exercise together. And so I went out to the craft store and bought a bunch of beads. I bought red beads and yellow beads and put them all in a jar. And there's an even amount of red and yellow beads in here, uh, 720 of each. And each bead has a letter on it. One of 20 letters, A, B, C, D, E, all but six letters, 20 letters on each bead. And I said, what we're going to do, boys, is we're going to make some necklaces, and our necklaces are going to spell out God is creator of all, 20 beads long. And I told Luke, I want you to make a, a, necklace, or a bracelet with all yellow beads, spelling out God is creator of all. I said, Logan, I want you to make a, a, a bracelet spelling out God is creator of all with all red beads. And they understood what they were doing. And we were getting ready to get started when all of a sudden the power went out. And after we got over the excitement of sitting there in the dark, we decided that we were going to go forward with our exercise anyway. Couldn't see anything. So we started just blindly digging into this jar of beads and assembling our, our bracelets, putting them on one at a time. And we're talking and laughing as we go and having a good time and just enjoying the dark and one another's company as we put these different beads on this little bracelet. Well, pretty soon we were done, and they had, tw they had you know, used their sense of, of touch to count out 20 beads and made sure they had 20 beads on each of their bracelets. And we put them aside and went off and did some other things, and eventually the power came back on. I went back to look at those bracelets. You can imagine my shock when I saw that Luke's bracelet had 20 beads on it, and they were all yellow. And Logan's had 20 beads on it, and they were all red. And then I nearly fainted when I looked at those bracelets and saw that both of them spelled out, God is creator of all. All in the dark. How many of you believe that story? 
You guys have no faith. <laughs> All right, so the story didn't really happen that way. Uh, of course, the story's made up because of the probability of selecting 20 red beads and 20 yellow beads with just the right letters in just the right sequence would be an astronomical probability. And let me see if we could wrap our minds around just getting that, um, what we just explained, that happening. That would be, you know, 20 red beads, 20 yellow beads with 20 different letters in sequential order. That would come out to 1 in 10 to the 64th power. The pro- that's the probability that that would happen, okay? Now, let's put this number in a little bit of perspective. All right, the chances that you would be killed by lightning is 10 to the 6th power. 1 in 10 to the 6th power. All right, the, the number of seconds in 10 billion years, just imagine counting 1, 2, 3, 4. For 10 billion years, a time we can't wrap our minds around, that's just 10 to the 19th power. The, the, the number of atoms that are estimated to be in all of the elements on planet Earth, the number of atoms, you know how many atoms are in you know, a pen tip or is astronomical, but that would be estimated to be about 10 to the 50th power. Now, scientists and mathematicians would say anything over 10 to the 50th power would be absurd. So absurd that it is called statistically impossible. And so the chances that Luke and Logan would have assembled their necklaces 20 beads long, all with one color, spelling out God is creator of all, would be absurd. It would be statistically impossible. All right, are you with me? Let's go for the payoff here. Amino acids are the building blocks of life, and so we can consider these beads to be like amino acids. And the reason that we use um, 40 of them, uh, 20 red and 20 uh, yellow with uh, different letters on them, are because there are 39 different amino acids. There's 20 uh, different kinds of amino acids, but 19 of these amino acids have correspondingly reversed uh, structured amino acids that give us a total of 39 different amino acids that are possible. And these are the building blocks of life. And just like we made this bracelet, proteins or the, the building blocks of life are these amino acids put together in a specific sequence into a strand that makes a strand, okay? So we're considering how could this happen by chance that a strand of life would come together in just the right order with random selection. Are you with me? All right. So let's consider the hemoglobin protein. It's a simple protein. It's a strand of 287 beads long, or 287 amino acids. So we're being really simple here. There are um, strands and proteins that are 1,500 long, the more complex, self-replicating kind of, 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 of things. So what are the chances that the hemoglobin protein, with a strand of 287, with 39 different variables, could have come together just by chance. Well, that would be 39 times 287 different selections equals 39 to, uh, to the 287th power, which if we reduce that down to 10, would be 10 to the five, 456th power that this would happen by chance. And so it appears that the mathematical probability of the first hemoglobin protein would evolve by chance is wildly absurd. Wildly absurd. Now, again, just to put this number in perspective, this is the chance of getting killed by lightning. Okay? These are the number of seconds in a billion years. These are all the atoms in the, every element on planet Earth. Anything over and above this is considered to be so absurd it's statistically impossible. That is the chance that a simple protein like hemoglobin would come together by chance. And considering this for a simple protein, can you imagine the probability of even one type of complex, self-replicating human cell being produced by random chance? It's mind-boggling in terms of probability to think that a human being could have resulted from random choice or evolution. And again, even if this happened, against all odds, the question still remains, where did those building blocks come from? And who put them together? How did they come together? So, why do really smart, intelligent people believe in evolution? Number one, because they have faith. Just like I have faith in creation, they have faith in evolution. Second, people believe evolution because there are still big questions that have yet to be answered. Again, creationists don't have a watertight answer on every question. Yet after studying the evidence, 
I believe as a Christ follower, I don't have to just trust God and ignore the evidence. I believe that the majority of the evidence points to a magnificent God that lovingly and intentionally and intelligently created us. So again, just to review the three talking points, evolution doesn't try to answer the questions of where life came from. I hope you're writing the, these down. These would be great to have a conversation with someone with, again, with humility and, and love. Number two, both evolution and creation are issues of faith. And number three, it takes more faith to believe evolution. And if you're here today and, and you have been a skeptic of Christianity, and the issue that's kept you from coming to Christ has been, I just can't buy the whole six days of creation. Let me say, I understand that. And I hope that today has provided a little bit of evidence to make you say, hmm, maybe I need to do some more searching. But I would say that while I have specific beliefs and my denomination has specific, specific beliefs about creation, there is enough of a variety of interpretations of how the world was created within Christianity that I would say it should not be a stumbling block in someone coming to faith. Okay, You can trust Christ and not have all of the answers for how the world was created, right? But I just believe that sometimes the simplest and the most straightforward answer is the best answer. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I believe that. That's enough for me. And because I believe that, and I believe that God supernaturally created the world, I believe that he is certainly worthy of my worship.